You have Bibles at the back if you need one. We're going to be reading a lot of verses. But if you just want to play it safe, open up to John chapter 8. Because that's going to be the bulk of our time. John chapter 8. I'm going to start reading verse thir- from verse 13. And <clears throat> my heart just sharing what I did just a little bit ago and hearing everyone pray. I am so encouraged. I I can't wait to see what more the Lord will do. And it is so amazing to read anything, anything at all from God's holy word. This is God's word. This is the inspired word of God. The spirit of the God who says, let there be light. His spirit breathed life, inspiring men to write down the very words of truth, eternal words, words that will never pass away for us. It's always wonderful, but when we read the words of God, on earth, in the flesh, the very words of Christ. It just, it becomes even more amazing that God became one of us. We are about to launch out into another December, another Christmas season. Can you believe it? 23 is almost gone. And we focus always, we, we always focus more on Emmanuel, God with us. Oh, that we would focus more every day, Emmanuel, God with us. But just to bask in God here among us as one of us. We're going to hear Jesus speak. And Jesus speaks truth. Jesus is the truth. And he speaks truth to those in our text here that do not want to receive it. Yet he speaks it anyway, so that whosoever will believe, whoever will hear, take heed how you hear. Today is a day of salvation. Therefore, do not harden your heart. That means there's hope. If anyone came in here with a hardened heart, there's hope. Today is the day of salvation. John chapter 8, starting verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself because he says where I go, you cannot come? And he said to them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, 
when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And he spoke these, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Amen. Who are you? This, this question is the question of questions for humanity. Who is Jesus? This is the, the most important question. This is an eternal question, meaning this is the question that determines how we answer it, determines our eternal dwelling. Our destiny lies in how we choose to respond to this question. Who is Jesus? Jesus posed this question to his disciples. I mean, who, do, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, I love that. He didn't say the Son of God, even though he, he is forever the Son of God. He is God. Yet he said, who do men say that I, God in the flesh, am? The Son of Man. Who do men say that I am? Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're a you know, specific prophet, Elijah. Some say you're a good teacher. They have all kinds of things. Men say all kinds of things back then and even now today about who Jesus is. He's a good guy. He's a great teacher. He had some great things to share with us. I think he was a magician. I think this and that. A lot of I thinks out there. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? But then he says, but who do you say? Who do you say that I am? That is the ultimate question. And on the day of judgment, that question is the, when the books are open of our life, our life's account, how we lived our life will reflect how we answered that question. Did you believe or did you reject? Did you accept or did you shun the gospel of Jesus Christ? Did you answer the Father's call that has gone out to all mankind Come, come, let us reason together. Whosoever will believe. Did you answer that call with a yes, Lord, I will come? Or with anything but? No, not now, or never. Or maybe later. Today is a day of salvation, and the call that went out from the beginning goes out right now. Who are you, these men say? Now, there are many who ask that question, praise the Lord, from a right heart. Who is Jesus? I want to know. I want to know who this God is who has come down, sent his son to me to die for me so that I could be saved to save me from my sins. Who is Jesus? And countless multitudes have, have come to know Christ, have come into the arms of their Savior because they asked this question and then pressed in to know who he is and put their faith in him and believed unto righteousness. Praise God. But that is not how these men were asking this question. These Pharisees, these Jews are asking this question in a mocking, accusatory, fault-finding way. Who are you? The context alone shows that. But we know these enemies of the Lord. We know their stubborn, wicked, rebellious hearts. Time and time and time again, they had the gospel not only spoken to them, but demonstrated to them. Yet they rejected it because they chose not to believe in the name of, above all names, Jesus Christ. Who are you? Our main text is in verse 25. It's what follows this question of who are you? Jesus answered the question this way. Just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. Hear that again. Who are you? Jesus said. The very same thing that I have been saying to you from the very beginning. 
There's so much power in this one line, this one answer from Jesus. I marvel at it. And there's beauty, there's stunning beauty in Jesus' words, especially considering he's speaking this to rebellious, unrepentant hearts. He has been calling to us and revealing himself from the beginning. Jesus says, I've been saying this from the beginning. But what is that beginning? That's my question for us to, to chew on today. Jesus says, who am I? Just what I've been telling you from the beginning. What beginning? Is it from the beginning of this conversation? Was Jesus referring, was, as he's, he is answering these men, so is he just telling them, you know, from the beginning of this conversation, which we are jumping in in the middle of an account here. So there's already been dialogue. There's already been something happening before this. So is Jesus saying, this is what I've been saying to you all day long from the beginning when you first came to me today. I've been saying who I am. Is that the beginning? Or is it the beginning? Do we go further back? The beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry when he revealed himself. When John the Baptist said, look, there he is. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Go, there he is. Go after him. And from that point on, Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is that the beginning? From that point on, he's saying, from the beginning, I told you who I am. Or do we go further back? Is it the beginning of his life? Jesus. Which, how can that even, how can he even say those words? The beginning. How can God have a beginning? God is infinite. Jesus is God in the flesh. How can we talk about the beginning of Jesus' life? Great is the mystery, Paul said. He is forever the Son of God and forever the Son of Man. He never laid down his deity. He never laid down his lordship. But at a point in time, in the flesh, he became one of us. He had a beginning like you and I. Fully God. That incorruptible seed. Fully God. Yet. 100% fully man in his flesh, the Bible says, dwelt the fullness of the Godhead, of the infinite Godhead in his body. Great is a mystery. We're going to spend the next few weeks worshiping him, especially on that subject as we approach Christmas. But is that the beginning he's talking about from his beginning? Or is it the beginning of these men's lives. Is he speaking about since you were a child? From your infancy? I've been calling out to you. Is that the beginning? How about this beginning? In the beginning. Is that the beginning he's talking about? Let's break these down. These five points. Which beginning? Because I can make a case for all five of these beginnings. How about from the beginning of this specific conversation? If you look at the beginning of chapter 8, there's another beginning. If you look at, look at verse 2, now early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Okay, so this is what precedes the text that I read to us today. We have Jesus sitting, teaching in the temple. He is taking the scriptures and illuminating them to shine the full light of their weight upon him. He is teaching himself from the scriptures. We read, you read in uh, Luke where... It's, the scroll is handed to him when he begins his earthly, earthly ministry. It's handed to him. He reads a prophecy about the Messiah. He closes it and he says, now it's fulfilled. Basically, that's me. I'm him. He's teaching in the synagogue here. And, but then these men bring in this woman caught in adultery. And we know. We don't have to go deep into this count. If you have any familiar, familiarity at all with this account you know 
They cared not for the law of Moses. They just wanted to trip up Jesus. And they, they despised this woman. They despised Jesus. They disguised, despised all of God's creation. They cared not for humanity except for their own skin and their own selfish pride and reputation. They wanted to take Jesus down. And so they brought this woman who's caught in adultery. And they said, what are, you, what are we going to do here? Moses said that she should be stoned. That's what the law says, but what do you say? That just right there showed the, her, their own hypocrisy because they, they always said, we hold to Moses. But here they are talking to a rabbi, a teacher as they call him, and saying, Moses said this, but what do you say? Showing that they're even open to some, some new interpretation. They don't care what Moses said. What do you say? And Jesus rips their mask off, exposes their wicked hearts, and say, okay, you who have hatred and murder and sin all in your heart, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And one by one, they know they're sinners. They know before God, if they throw one little pebble, they'll be condemned on the day of judgment before God. And so they drop their stones and they walk away. And then Jesus says to the woman, Where's your con those who are condemning you, they're, they're not here. Where's your accusers? They've gone. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You've got a new start. Now go and sin no more. And then he turns to everyone. He says, I am the light of the world. You know, when he says, I'm the light of the world, everyone there with any understanding of scriptures, which definitely included the scribes and Pharisees, they knew what he was saying. Because of the prophecy that a light would dawn on the people, the people who sat in darkness, light would shine upon them. Jesus says, I'm that light, I'm the Messiah. Jesus had already started this conversation for the beginning of this day, this conversation. He was showing who he was. They knew, but they would not receive it. So could we say that Jesus' words here relate to the beginning of this conversation? Yes, I can talk more on that, but we don't need to belabor that point. What about the next point? Could we also say that it's from the beginning of his earthly ministry? Absolutely. Because after Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, it says that in Matthew chapter 4, John was then thrown in prison by Herod. And it says the very next verse, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Oh, track with me on, on these points. It's going gonna, it's gonna to build to something so beautiful. From the beginning of his earthly ministry, Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So certainly we can say, when Jesus said, I've been telling you the same thing from the beginning, we can easily point from this verse alone. Yes, from the very beginning, when he revealed himself as a Messiah, this, is, this was his message, that he is God. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come. He revealed his ministry. For this purpose I have come to, re to reveal the truth that I am. That I am. In our, at the end of our chapter here, in chapter 8 of John, he says, Before Abraham was, I am. He's building up. More and more, he's revealing that he is in the Father, and the Father is in him. He and the Father are one. But from the beginning of his ministry, yes, he has been revealing himself through his words, through his, through his gentle touch, through his healing, raising the dead. And a few chapters back, before our text, he had raised someone from the dead. He's revealing in so many different ways from the very beginning of his ministry. I am God. Do you believe me? Yet we can say there's another beginning. 
to consider the beginning of his life. From the very beginning, from his birth, God was declaring he is the Messiah. Let alone the prophecies leading up to his birth. Let alone put aside the angels proclaiming in the heavens to the shepherds and the shepherds coming and saying, we've seen the, we've seen the Messiah, the child's been born, come see him. All of those things. How about when Jesus was brought into the temple? And Simeon, this old man, took up baby Jesus in his arms. And the Spirit had already revealed to Simeon, this is the promised Messiah. This is the light that has dawned. This is what Simeon says, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things that were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. And for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, the sword will pierce through your own soul also. That the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. From the beginning of his life it has been said of Jesus. He is the one. This is the Messiah. This is God. With us. Unto you a child is born. Unto you a son is given. What are his names? Wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Mighty God, everlasting Father. From the very beginning of his life, I've been telling you. This is the message I've been telling you from the beginning. When he, when he grew up at, at age 12, he was brought into the temple. And, you know, Joseph and Mary lost track of him. Whoops, that was a bad parenting mistake. Joseph and Mary could not write a book on parenting, at least in that moment. But they found him again. What, what happened? Where were you? We looked all over for you. And he said, did you not know that I would be about my father's business? But they did not understand what he spoke. But he spoke it nonetheless. This is why I've come. This is who I am from the very beginning. Mom, Dad, the angels told you. Don't you know? This is who I am. When Jesus prayed before his arrest, he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for this hour, for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. This is my purpose. He was always saying from the very beginning, from the moment he could speak, he was speaking the truth that he is the one. Even though he came to fully realize who he was, he grew in wisdom and stature before God and men. Oh, so marvelous. And yet, he revealed all that the Father had revealed to him. There's another beginning. Is it the beginning of these men's lives? Psalm 139, for you formed me in my inward parts, excuse me, <laughs> for you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Wow. God saw you, saw me when we were yet, we were not born yet. In our mother's womb, he knew us. He told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Wow. From the very beginning of our life, from the very beginning of these lives of the men he was speaking to, we could say God has been revealing. He knew them, and his spirit has been drawing them. Oh, can we, say, can we not say that God wonderfully draws the, the hearts of little children? 
God's, God's gospel goes out to all mankind. When, when he was te teaching and preaching to the multitudes, there were those who tried to bring their kids to Jesus so that he could bless them. And the, the disciples said, no, it's not time for kids. It's time for the grown-ups to hear the truth about the kingdom. And Jesus said, what are you doing? This, this is what it's all about. You've got to accept the kingdom of heaven as this little child. And he took him up in his arms and blessed him. God speaks. God watches over. He calls out to the children. The Bible speaks of angels in some way that I don't even pretend to even begin to understand. And yet there are angels that always see the face of God that are assigned to children. Mysteries that we don't fully know, especially when we look at things that happen in this world because of sin. Yet, God calls out from the very beginning of our lives as little children. He's beginning to reveal himself to us. I gotta, I gotta jump ahead here to get to this point that I'm building to. From the beginning, from the beginning of all time, Jesus said, look at our text again. Then they said to him, verse 25, who are you? Jesus said to them, just what I've been saying to you from the beginning. What has God been saying from the beginning? Well, the very first beginning words, the beginning text of the word of God says, in the beginning, God. Can we go back? Is Jesus referring to that beginning? I say yes, and even before that beginning, before the foundations of the world, Jesus Christ was chosen to be the savior of the world. God seeing all things. God is all knowing. Yet how marvelous it is that God knowing what would come became a man with a will of a man. Jesus chose as a man, chose to die for us. He knew the prophecies. He knew who he was. Yet it says in his flesh, he chose to go to the cross. He could have avoided it. He could have chosen another way. Yes, Jesus had a will like us. He became fully one of us. And he chose, Father, if there's any way let this cup pass from me. Why would Jesus pray that? If he knows all things, that was his humanity crying out. If there's any other way. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And he has given mankind a free will. Jesus took upon himself, fully man, that same free will. Great is the mystery. It is amazing. He put aside all that he is in his Godhead. He didn't, he didn't cease to be God, but he laid all those weapons aside. He, Jesus said on the cross, I could, I could call down 12 legions of angels, as was said about the cross, and they could rescue me. But he didn't. He laid aside all his weapons as the Almighty and fought for your soul and my soul in the flesh. That's incredible. And for anyone to make the gospel something less than whosoever will believe, it's just, oh, it just angers me that someone does not see the infinite love of God who chose in the flesh to die for us. In the beginning, that God who said, let there be light, Listen to what John says. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the light, and the life was the light of men. See a theme here? And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then verses down from there, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only 
begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the beginning, from the beginning, God has been declaring who this Jesus is and been calling out to man, run to me. If you have your Bible, quick, quickly turn to Romans chapter 1. this all I hope this doesn't doesn't get muddy here Romans chapter 1 starting verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, that's the beginning, guys. For, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Do you hear that? Mankind, all man, every man, every woman is without excuse. No one can say that God was not fair. No one can say that God did not give me a chance to believe. Because all those who believe in him shall be saved. And those who do not believe will be condemned. Belief, faith in God is the means, is a vehicle by which we receive salvation. It is the grace of God that saves us. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. It is a gift, and we, in, we are saved by grace through faith. Paul says the wrath of God comes upon the sons of men because they don't use the faith. They refuse. They refuse. They suppress the truth, he says. They know, even from creation alone, they're without excuse. We, they know there's a God, just like these wicked men. They kept saying, but who are you? Jesus said, I've been telling you from the very beginning, even before the flood, even before when I said, let there be light, the stars declare my majesty. From the very beginning, I've been telling you, and I've been revealing myself to you, but you will not repent. If you believe, the verse goes on in our text in John, Jesus says, if you believe, you'll be saved, but you refuse to believe. Paul, in the book of Acts, speaking to those who are worshiping all kinds of different gods, he says, let me tell you about the real God, the only God. He made the world and everything in it. Paul goes back to the beginning. He uses the beginning of time to preach the gospel, just as Jesus did to these wicked men. He says, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to, li gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Why? so that they should seek the Lord. God has instilled in every man the opportunity to seek him. And that is the sovereign will of God. I have given them boundaries. I have given them life. I breathe into them. I hold their being together so that they would seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You see the heart of God from the very beginning, it was so. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, before the foundations of the world were laid, Jesus Christ was chosen. God knowing all, yet a choice is still to be made. Whosoever would believe shall be saved. We know the text, John 3.16, John 3.17. I don't even have to say it. John 
3.18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned. Period. If you believe, you will not be condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. Jesus was speaking to people who did not believe in him. And they, as Paul said, were suppressing the truth even from the beginning, seeing the creation and, and knowing that there's a creator, knowing the prophecies. They studied the prophecies. They knew everything that Jesus was doing and saying that he had to be the Messiah. In fact, when they crucified him, they revealed that they knew it was him, yet they still crucified the Son of God. He's speaking to those who do not believe. Therefore, he said, you're going to die in your sin because you don't believe in me. If you do believe, you'll be saved. But you don't believe in me. So right now, you're condemned, and you're going to die in your sins. But his heart of love, from the beginning, this is what I've been telling you. I am the light of the world. Do you not remember what I said before this adulterous woman that you brought before me? He who believes in me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He clearly said who he was, but these men didn't want to receive it. I, this text, I'm going to just be done with these notes. This text was laid on my heart. I, I know in large part because of all that I've been seeing God work in my friend's life. I've known him for 36 years, and I've seen him fight against God most of those years. I have seen him at one point. He was very receptive to it, and he even made a profession of faith. But looking back on that, I think it was just he wanted it because it, everyone else was pushing him, pushing him, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus. He said, okay. But he didn't really latch on. He didn't truly believe. And quickly he went the other direction. There, were time, there was a time when he would not even let me speak from, from Scripture. But guess what? From the very beginning, God was calling out to Josh. Jesus said to these wicked men, you know who I am because I've been telling you from the very beginning. But he says to all mankind, you're without excuse. I love you. I knew you before you were even formed in the womb. I knew you because I, I breathed life into you. I imagined you God imagined you before you were even conceived in your mother's womb. He knew you. And from the very beginning, he was revealing himself to you. And I, I can see throughout Josh's life, him revealing himself to my friend. And all the prayers that have gone up, even when he would not receive the truth, God kept telling him him who he is, kept revealing his love for him. And now I see the grace, the faithfulness of God. All those things from his past have connected. God has connected the dots. And he sees from the beginning God was working in my life. He had near-death experiences many times. In, I won't go into it. I have seen miracle upon miracle in my friend's life. And the greatest miracle of all, God's faithfulness. Answering the prayers of friends and family and churches for decades now praying for him. God never stopped calling out. Never stopped saying, this is what I've been saying, Josh, from the very beginning. And Josh believes. And he's not only believing in his heart, he's confessing with his mouth. I heard over the phone with, his, with a nurse there in the hospital, I heard him speak about his faith in Jesus. I can't tell you how excited I am. And I get to go down and give him a hug. My brother in Christ, we've always called ourselves brothers, but it is so beautiful to see his light shining 
in the darkest of valleys. He's in the valley of the shadow of death. Yet, he knows who's been calling to him from the beginning. You see the beauty in this. It was a long, long way to get there, maybe too long. But every one of us has the same testimony, whether we realize it or not. God has been revealing himself to you and to me. And we are without excuse. Praise God. Even when we are in our sin, condemned. Even walking in sin, in that moment, we are condemned. Praise God. We're not cast to hell. We still have a chance. We're still breathing. Even in our condemnation, God keeps revealing himself, keeps <sighs> revealing himself. These men had a chance, yet they refused. Jesus said, he gave them another chance. Guys, if you believe me right now, you'll be saved. But they would not. Praise God, he still makes the call. Whosoever will believe shall not be put to shame. They will be saved. I don't do this often. Does anyone have something to add before I close in prayer? You know, I've read I've read this passage so many times and this this one verse, verse 25 has never hit me other than just in the context meaning but isn't it beautiful how the word of God is living and powerful it is relevant to this very second in my life and I see a deeper truth about my father's love for humanity and that from the very beginning he's been saying the same thing and he'll keep saying it until you reach out and say I believe and if you refuse Jesus said in our text after this, he said, when I'm lifted up, all men will know who I am. It's now in this life, the cross. We have to come to the cross in this life and say, I see my risen Savior. He's not there anymore, but I see him lifted up for me, buried, now ascended to heaven. He's alive. He is my life. In this life, we look to the cross. We see him lifted up and we yield to him. If we refuse in this life, we will see the cross on judgment day. He will be lifted up and we will be cast down to outer darkness into eternal torment because the call from the very beginning, we kept refusing. I love this quote. I'll end with this. D. Thomas said that all of Jesus' utterances meet in him as rays meet in the sun. I don't know if that hits you, but you think of light rays from the sun. Every ray of light you see. We were driving yesterday. We saw rays coming through kind of foggy atmosphere. and The sun was going down and through the trees. We saw these rays. So beautiful. Every single ray of light all over the universe has its root in the sun. And, and this author says, that's every word of God, every word of Christ, has its root in him. He is the I am. He is everything that we need. And whether we know it or not, he is everything that we desire. It is up to us to yield to the message that has been sent to us from the beginning. He loves us. And he desires that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What a mighty God. Will you stand? Lord, we started off the service singing a song about simplicity. That you have reduced everything that matters to one decision to choose you. Thank you for the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for your heart of love that calls out to us from our beginning, from the beginning of the world, the beginning of time. You have always loved us, and you will always call out to the sinner, come, let us reason together. Thank you for your great salvation. Lord, help us not just to receive it, but to abide in you and to proclaim this great salvation that we would shout on the mountaintops of this great Savior who loves us and has saved us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for what you are doing, what you will do. Go with us now as we hold this word in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen.